My name's uh, Mick Moore, currently the Maintenance Authority and Works Control Process Owner for Doonray. And what I want to go through with you this morning is uh, that sort of float thought process, looking at uh, site maintenance strategy and the factors that influence it. So I want to take you through the legal and regulatory lifetime plan, um, which is what we are currently decommissioning doing rate two. Uh, and there is a cost and schedule associated with that. So we've got a fixed set of resource. We've recently adopted asset management, um, which is past 55. Um, public available specification and that has changed the approach really um, to the way that we do maintenance and the way that we manage our assets and I'll take you through a bit more of that as we go through the presentation. Um, we have to adopt a balanced approach to ensure cranes are not overly maintained whilst also meeting the requirements um, and obviously there's a balance there, a lot of factors that influence that, stakeholders, regulators and that's the bit of the presentation that uh, I'm going to take you through. Um, I'll also take you through a bit more detail about how we do that specifically for cranes, but it's not just for cranes, it's strategy across the whole site. I'll take you through uh, how we've reduced the risk, and that's related <laughs> to a nuclear crane that we use for the prototype fast reactor at Dunray. Uh, and then we gather a number of that information up uh, every month, and I'll take you through how we use that information to manage the site risk. Now that's bringing you up from sort of the detail up to the strategy. As maintenance authority, I'm responsible for all that strategy um, and really um, it's just to show you how we've, how we've got some information on a monthly basis that we can use. We're not, not too much information, but just the right level. So the factors that shape it then, um, well obviously the people who operate the plant want it available and there's some requirements on that, how much it can be down for and uh, what the reliability is, state in the safety case, that kind of thing. Um, you've got your safety case designations of particular items of the plant, um, KSRE, SRE, EPE, and they are statutory, and the regulators ask us questions on that, and we have to prove that we are maintaining it on a regular basis. There's a current liability figures. Has it been breaking down more? Um, is it okay? Um, and the answer to those questions is, do we need less maintenance, do we need more maintenance? Um, and what does that maintenance look like? Proximity of the asset to the critical path. We have a number of assets, I'll take you through a slide as we go through later, um, that if we do not have availability, can affect the critical path, i.e. that means that decommission of the Dunray site will move out uh, directly proportional to the amount of days that that asset is out of service. We also have uh, scrap resource, we've got to make sure that people are trained, that's instrumentation, electrical, mechanical, and the engineers that write the method statements and risk assessments. We have the legal, legal and regulatory. Um, we've got Pure, we've got Lola, site license conditions. They are the bits that have to be made that are the baseline, and that is the baseline of, of how we shape the maintenance approach to each asset. Previous and future due to requirements, specifically for cranes, how much have they been used in the past, how much are they going to be used in the future. We have cranes that have been parked for a, a set number of years that will be used in accordance with a lifetime plan in five, six years time. We can't afford to replace those cranes, but we have to make sure they're available. Sometimes we can stand them down and then we've got to bring them back into service. So they all affect what, we, what the approach to maintenance is. Licence conditions. Um, spoke about that in an earlier slide. Um, you can see what they are. Licence condition 28. We also have a man we have a manual um, which keeps in compliance of that. I am the process owner for that manual. It's called Manual 2010. Uh, that requires we have a schedule for each of those designated assets: KSRE, SRE, EPE, statutory, and we have to do those on a regular basis and prove that we do them. Safety case for each plant that designates the safety critical items. Uh, gives us a list and then the two come together so we maintain the list in accordance with the schedule that keeps us in compliance. Spoke about that, don't need to go through that in any more detail but that's, that's something that we have to uh, make sure we do as the baseline. 23, safety case and then the design um, makes the claims and that comes back into the engineering schedule. People aren't uh, familiar with that, uh, that's where we bring the designated items from. For example, that will describe items on the load path of a crane. 
we have a site manager, site management, site maintenance management software tool called Mainman, and all the items, assets are logged into that. Uh, a maintenance schedule is attached to that, and that spits out the job cards. That's how we track it, um, and that goes directly to the trade trades personnel. Spoke a bit about Pass 55. Uh, that was an initiative across the whole of the NDA state. Uh, we had to develop, integrate uh, within and with current management systems and implement an asset management process. That means an end to end process, effectively. Uh, it means what you do at the front end arm and what you do at the back end asset disposal. And we have to demonstrate we're doing all the steps within that. Um, an independent uh, audit comes and verifies where we are on a scale of 20 aspects of past 55. Um, it is available on the net and the NDA website for anybody who wants to look at that, but quite an interesting process. We are under decommissioning. Um, we're not a train company, we're not an airline company, and we say that we do not have to maintain everything um, as rigorously as the safety critical items. Um, some people have other ideas. Um, but we don't. But in actual fact, we have past 55 has enabled us to shift the focus from the general maintenance to the things, the safety critical items, and the business critical assets that matter. So it's been um, it's been able it's been able to give us a tool to demonstrate to um, our site management and the NDA that we're developing that we're providing value for money. I'll show you how we've done that as we've gone through. What do the stakeholders want then? Well, the decommissioned op teams, they want the asset availability and they want to lift things when they say they want to lift things and they get upset if they don't. Um, the operators, um, the, the operators themselves, they get upset if uh, it's not available and there's breakdowns. And the NDA and the, and the management, they want safe operation, an optimised maintenance schedule, and that means, in our book, value for money. Um, and that's the balance that we have to make. Are we over maintaining? Are we under maintaining? How, we do, how do we strike that balance? I'll give you a bit, a bit more of that as we go through. ONR, as we've heard this morning, uh, the AT holder, which is the authority to operate holder for the facility, he is the person that is responsible for safety. He wants a compliant maintenance schedule and he's held, held accountable to that for the regulators as well as I am. So he has to identify all those structures and he does that through the safety case. We have a lifetime plan. That lifetime plan says when the end date of doing rate is, and all the assets, all the facilities are developed in accordance with that. Each asset um, has a risk, how it can impact that lifetime plan. Some are higher, some are lower. That is really an important shift from where we've moved to. So we're, so we're basing maintenance on asset risk. So, asset management, um, we came up with a policy. You can see it there, legal is the baseline, um, certainly for the safety critical, environmental critical items. And we have the British standards, that is the baseline. And then we, when we talk about time, and we talk about cost, and we talk about completion of the contract programme uh, within this finite uh, resource that we have available. Then it's strategic maintenance. Um, so think about what I said before, some of the equipment has lost its performance, some will need to maintain its performance. We've got to look forward to what interventions we can put in place to make sure that asset is available. How do we do that? Well, we plot it against a lifetime plan. I'll give you a slide on how we do that later in the presentation. We've got to demonstrate compliance with good industry practice by ensuring doing right assets operate safely and effectively, safely and effectively, looking at the cost benefit again and add maximum value at minimum cost to the business. Detail on there, uh, but the essence is that we're linking the site mission to the asset management policy. So on the right hand side there, site mission, what's the strategic, strategic plan, what's the asset management policy, we're talking about value, we're talking about time, we're talking about cost, compliance, and then the objectives, what we're wanting to do. The colours on the right hand side there equate to, on the next slide I'll show you how we've boiled that down into a list of drivers. So what are the things within, within maintenance that we're looking for that will drive those objectives in the right direction, you know, in other words to achieve a cost and safety and also a set, of main, a set of metrics right down at the bottom there. How will we measure if we're going in the right direction? 
this slide sort of demonstrates it, uh, and you can see, looking back to the previous slide, the colour coding, well, maintenance costs, operational costs, the arm approach at the front end, so more, more use of the arm approach, sale of assets, if we can get assets off that main, main man system, well then there's a the bureaucracy, there's the, the, the check-in, uh, all that reduce the cost. We've got a, a new set of, um, or developed set of um, processes, risk and performance, business critical assets, and then some new documentation across the bottom there, asset care plans. What is critical, how have you categorised that your plant will affect the critical path of the lifetime plant? If it is on that critical path, what are you doing about it? Have you got spares? How do you know, how do you know that that's just not a paper exercise? That's the challenge we've been putting back to the operators. So it's identify the attributes, they're the attributes to underpin those objectives, identify the actions and develop metrics and monitoring. That ensures that we're going in the right direction or tells us if we're not. This is the asset risk escalation model. Uh, what we're asking is, well, that's fine for business critical assets and safety estimate assets, but demonstrate to us that you are caring for all your assets on an equal basis. Well, at the bottom end here, um, we've got the asset care plans, and that is looked after by the facility engineers, the AET holders, and the maintenance teams. If that risk is manageable, well, then we'll let them get on with it. They say, yes, that's fine. Um, come back and tell us next month how, how it's getting on. Any of, those, any of the assets that are critical and they can't manage the risk, i.e. it's breaking down or they need an intervention, we move it up to the, to the next level. And the hub of that, that uh, next level is a business critical asset meeting that takes place every month, attended by the directors and sometimes the managing director. At that point, we decide to run the, any interventions back through the lifetime plant, the change control, and allocate money to reducing the risk. If you can reduce the risk by a pound, how much you're spending, is it worth it? That's the kind of conversation that we're having. If we cannot manage that asset, and it was something that um, was at doom rate before the contract took over, well then it goes onto the NDA risk website, uh, risk model. Um, and that may then go up to government for additional funding and we'll make it available. So that, so that affects the whole programme. Um, so that kind of process goes on every month uh, and assets will come on and go off of that process depending on how we manage the risk. How do we know what's critical? How do we communicate that to the workforce? Well, a simple plan on a piece of paper. All those squares on there are facilities or plants that are business critical. The red ones affect the critical path. What we say to the people in the stores and the individual maintenance managers, if you see anything on this critical path, that is, has the potential to cause a one day, we want everybody hands on the pumps. We don't want one guy writing his Christmas cards while the other one is on the phone trying to fix it. So that's the kind of plan we put out, the response levels, um, and that has worked quite well on at least one particular occasion. Um, how much does it cost if we lose a day? Well, we have a PBI, a performance based incentive, £250,000. Not all if we lose a day, but on top of that, some of the individual plans might be looking at £100,000 a day. So it's a lot of money if we lose a day off that critical path. We can recover, but that's the impact. So we're now going from, well, okay, things don't matter too much if they break down to you're back in the forefront, maintenance is back in the forefront of performance. That's been a big shift. So let's look at cranes then specifically. Um, we've got a written scheme there. There's 77 cranes, um, right the way down from small ones up to the big ones. Um, some cranes are set of business critical assets. Um, asset fail has a potential to impact, I spoke about that. Uh, the baseline on this left hand side here um, is third party inspection uh, and, a, and a maintenance schedule in the site maintenance management tool. So that's really the compliance. Over the top of that we say well what has been the previous duty, what is the current duty, um, what interventions do we need to put in place in the future to make sure that this crane is available for service, obsolescent, that kind of thing. Um, and that brings us, so we've got your safety on one end and then we're bringing in the business risk. So that adds an extra layer of maintenance and a justification. And bearing in mind that on the small, on the, on the, on the other end, the general maintenance, the things that we don't necessarily have to do, we're looking to reduce that. So the balance is there, reduce the general maintenance, increase the safety and the business critical asset. What the ONR, uh, inspectors look for, but well, we've had some uh, insights on that, we're looking at the load path. 
Um, that's basically where, where the main focus is. Specialist checks then, um, structures, um, designed for degradation processes, including corrosion, erosion, uh, chemical and physical environment. Um, obviously we're near the sea at Dunray. Most of the facilities are inside, some are not. Um, what tools can you use for inspection? Laser alignment of rails, previously had that done. Magnetic particle inspection of hooks, eddy current testing of ropes, oil sampling of gearbox and vibration analysis. This is a quite interesting um, forward bit of thinking that we've put in place. It gives us some leading indicators. There's some uh, references there to British Standard 7121 about uh, what you should look for. And how we do it is we've developed a maintenance testing protocol for overhead cranes. Um, and it's a hierarchical approach. Uh, it's a planned maintenance schedule for each crane. It's not the same for everyone. Um, the written scheme is the basis and it's based on asset risk. So how can it affect the lifetime plan? But don't forget the safety side is the baseline. So we monitor, monitor the correctives against the busy, busy critical cranes every day. The team does that and we look for any trends in, um, in correctives, i.e. what things, is it limit switches, is it, um, is it a coupling, is it an oil seal, what other things that are causing the issues on a day-to-day -day basis before they actually break down. We've changed the focus, I've spoke about that, and the focus is going on to the business critical assets, the things that are going to affect us in risk. We're collecting trend and lean indicators on, cri on critical assets. One of the things that I spoke about is the vibration analysis. And we're also planning for future interventions. So against the lifetime plan, what do we need to do to make sure that that crane is in service when we need it? Into the detail. Gearboxes, um, major part of the load path. We get asked some difficult questions, quite rightly so. Um, we've got some aging cranes. How are you going to assess whether that gearbox is fit for purpose. So we put in a hierarchical approach. So we start off with visual and audible monitoring, doing functional testing, and that picks up things like uh, bearings misalignment, gear mesh frequencies. Uh, we can look at the gearbox lubricant. Is there any particulate in there? Um, is the gearbox lubricant right? Lab analysis, endoscope inspections, and the final one is strip down inspection. Um, anybody who's been involved in maintenance knows that um, you start off with a machine that is working correctly. When you stripped it down and put it back together, you get a fault. We do not always want to do that unless we have to. And some of the gearboxes, as you know, are big items of equipment. Up in the air, we've got additional industrial risks. Acoustic emission analysis. Um, I've not done much on that, although one of the crane companies did, um, did say we should use it. I've yet to experience it. I don't know whether anybody else has on, on to what effect, but that's something that we are looking at. Brakes, operational efficiency of the service and the backup brakes. Um, obviously, you need to back off the, the front brake to let the, make sure the back one will hold the load. Um, but you're into operating hoist at maximum raising lower speed and ensure both brakes work effectively. This is an example of how we reduce the risk on one particular crane. Um, there's a, a sketch of it on the next slide. It's a crane that we use for um, PFR, prototype fast reactor, and it's lifting a, uh, a significant flask, nearly about 120 tons, and it's got a flask arrestor gear arrangement on it that prevents the flask from dropping or presents the, prevents the nuclear related incident. You can read it on there. Um, it was, a, it, was experience, it was causing us to um, experience a number of unreliability issues on the crane. We had removed the sodium um, from the reactor and therefore we made the case to remove the, the flask arrest gear. Uh, that, threw a, that threw a safety case. There you can see it's similar, we're commenting, it's similar kind of thing to the, um, the, 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 the brake arrester that's outside. You've got a number of uh, tool rods that run down the side uh, with screw rod latches and you can see that that takes an independent load path should there be any issues with the hoist rope. Um, there were some encoders on the end and if they weren't maintaining the same frequency, the same uh, synchronisation with the rope, well the thing would lock up one side to the other for a whole number of reasons. Um, so we decided to remove those, the guides there, the green, green guides, just there, 
So we replace those with rods and they are followers. Um, so that's a significant risk. We're looking at something like £50,000 a month risk resting on that crane and we reduce that to about five. Three-year-old NASA interventions, that's the bit I spoke about. We're looking ahead, what do we need to do in the next three years? Um, and we've, we've aligned that with the lifetime plan. How we've done that is, um, that is, a, that is a, an item, line item out of the lifetime plan, and we've put in a number of risk activities in there against it. So first of all, assess what each of those cranes are doing. From that assessment, we can then decide how we're going to intervene. Do we need to intervene? Uh, we've got activities in there. Up here on the right hand side will be when we need to use those cranes. So those activities will take place before we need to use it. That's how we plan it in. We update that every year. Condition based maintenance. This is not a crane. Uh, we haven't not, we found anything wrong on the cranes, but this is a fan. Uh, we do this ourselves. What you can see on there is a peak and it shows looseness and it shows insecurity. What we actually found was the fact that the, the fan in this particular occasion um, had a hole in it. Further down the back end, you can see some peaks there. That also indicated a problem with the bearing. We'd recently changed the bearing, we didn't know what that was. We stripped it down, we found out that although the bends were stored, stores coded, um, the wrong tolerance, level of tolerance had been fit, fitted on the Cooper bearing, hence causing breakdown of lubrication. So we will apply that same technique to cranes, or we are applying that same technique to cranes. You can see the imbalance there on the big peak. That's one blade as it goes round. How do we going to apply that? Gear defects, a similar kind of pattern. Um, we will be able to pick uh, each one of those gear mesh frequencies up. We'll be able to see from the sidebands if there's any issues, misalignment or where that will give us some indication or whether or not we need to take that top off that gearbox. Major step forward in leading indicators. I know other people use it, other industries use it, but that's something that we've, been, we've started this year at Doomray. That is a report. You can see there the alarm levels. We will get that report across the whole patch of cranes every month um, and fans, and we'll, know, we'll need to know whether we need to worry about it um, or the maintenance manager needs to, needs to worry about it. Don't expect you to read all that detail, but we roll all that information up into one dashboard. We have asset numbers there, our reduction, sorry, we have fault numbers there, correctives for different items. We have assets there, remember the cost reduction, um, so the, the, the asset reduction is directly linked to cost. So if we can decommission those facilities early, get rid of those assets, we are reducing cost. We track the maintenance cost against each division there. We've um, got fuels division, got waste, we've got fuel cycle area. That is the cost on a cumulative, bus uh, cumulative basis, month by month, coming down. We also look at the cost of a plan maintenance work order and the cost of a corrective maintenance uh, work order. So we know that's, so we're con continually optimising that. If we reduce the planned, are the correctives rising? So if, if, if the, that ratio changes, we need to start to change the maintenance regime. We're also looking at number of work orders, how many work orders go out to the teams, and that gives us information to feed into the, into the cost there. So we're looking at, that gives us information, feeding up through the blocks into the performance trending, and also the three year rolling asset management plan. Remember, we need to look ahead. So all that information gives us time, gives us a trend now, and it gives us, it gives us information to, to be able to make maintenance decisions in the future. So that really is how we connect the detail of each crane up to site strategy. So in summary then, we've got a plan maintenance schedule, that's the basis, uh, and that conforms with legislation, and then we enhance that depending on the risk. We develop the dashboard, so we don't want to spend any time, any more time collecting the data and doing, doing nothing with it. We're actually using that data to inform decision making. And that gives us a strategic view on a month-by-month -month basis of all crane failures and the, ass that the assets across the whole site. And we, and we get a wider view than simply just the health and safety risk.